want to start out by saying welcome. My name's Chris Cassis, one of the pastors here at the Source Church, and we're beginning a brand new series called The Table. And if you think about the table, it's over food that relationships are built. It's over food that fellowship happens, right? I mean, think about it. Every single event in your life is over food. Birthday parties, what do they do? They got to figure out what? The food. Now, now I'm great at planning parties. I'm horrible with the details. That's where my wife comes in. I can say, let's have a party, but she needs to pick the food and she needs to pick the place. And yet, every single time we leave church, we say, what are we going to eat, right? It's, it's, it's food. Sometimes fights even happen over food. Weddings, you do a wedding ceremony and then you have the reception after. Why? Because it's a celebration. There's food involved. E- even funeral services, think about it. Funerals, after you do the service, a lot of people will go and they'll eat and they'll have food because it's food that relationships are built. When you date somebody for the very first time, you often go and have food. You sit and have a conversation. You sit and get to know each other. You see, food just brings this fellowship into play. What's interesting is how many times Jesus had meals in the New Testament. When Jesus was alive, he sat and had meals with people. And so the table is a series about Jesus' conversations over meals. In fact, in Luke 7, there's nine different occurrences. Now, we just picked the top five, but there's nine different occurrences where Jesus had meals with individuals. And what we find in Luke 7 is one of, one of Jesus' first meals that he has with somebody. And so if you're there in verse, Luke 7, verse 36... Luke is in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then just go to chapter 7, usually the big numbers, and go down to verse 36. There's an index in the front of your Bibles as well. And what we see here is, I'll just read it over you real quick. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at what? The table. We can do a better job than that. He reclined at... The table, this is known as the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. Is that she is a what? Sinner. She is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I got something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love her more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, as many sins have been forgiven as her great love has been shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in 
peace. Now what's interesting about this story is it takes place at a Pharisee's house where Jesus sits down at his table. And we see different characters. You have Simon the Pharisee, and then you have this woman that enters into the scene. And the camera kind of moves from one character to the other. And so you got these three separate episodes, and in this first episode, we have Jesus at a Pharisee's house. The Pharisee's name is Simon, that's what we know. Pharisees were often religious rulers of that day. They would be spiritual guides. They would be the people who ran the temple. They would what you would call a pastor of a church today. They were in charge of helping people to grow spiritually and to be an example before the people. They were supposed to lead them before God. They would be the ones that would often make the sacrifices, okay, as you came into the temple. The Pharisees, the priests, the Levites, the scribes, all of these people are holy men. And so you have this Pharisee who's trying to get people to follow after God. And Jesus goes to his house and reclines. And the question we have out of that is why does Jesus go to his house? Well, of course, Jesus, he's the son of God. He goes to the people's house who are the most godly, right? Isn't that where he goes? We don't know why Jesus goes to his house. Simon obviously invited him. Why did Simon invite him? Was he interested in what Jesus had to offer? Was he interested in what Jesus knew? I mean, Jesus was starting to gain a reputation at this point. And he's like, you know what? In order to elevate my social class, maybe I just invite the, the celebrity over to my house and everybody sees that he dines with me. Maybe he's thinking about his reputation. Is he really interested in Jesus? I would argue as we read through the story, he's probably not so interested in Jesus. He's probably a little curious on what Jesus maybe knows, but why did he invite him? And right when him and Jesus are eating at the table, they're beginning to recline, it changes scenes to a woman who breaks in and enters in. And Simon's going, why is this woman even here? Why, why is this woman part of this conversation? It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner, in verse 36, with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town. We don't know the woman's name. We don't know anything about her. All we know is that she's a sinner who lived a sinful life that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So Simon is going, okay, I got Jesus here, but why is this woman here? You see, one, it was sinful in order for a woman to be present in the midst of men while they were eating. Or I shouldn't say sinful, but it was an uncommon practice. It's why Martha got so mad at Mary when Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus instead of serving at the table. It was an uncommon practice. This woman bursts in and she begins to cry. And she begins to wipe Jesus with her tears, with her hair on his feet. It was a common practice for the men to recline back like on a couch as they were eating and dining. And so they were reclining back, they were eating, they were dining, and she bursts in and she begins to wipe Jesus with her tears. And she begins to put perfume on him. And Simon is like, why is this sinful woman? Now we don't know what sin she committed. Some people think maybe she was a prostitute, and that's why it doesn't give her name. That's why it doesn't refer to her. It just refers to her as a sinful woman. Obviously, everybody knew what her sin was, but we don't. Maybe she had some temptation that she was an alcoholic. Maybe she was thrown and had an affair on her husband. We don't know what it was, but everybody in the, sin, the city knew. Everybody, that's how her label is. She is a sinful woman. So we have the Pharisee Simon and the sinful woman. That's what the author wants us to know from the story. He compares 
the two. We have the patriarch and possibly the prostitute. We have the God-man and we have the low life. We have the sinner and we have the righteous in his eyes. Very opposite personas, very opposite reputation that the author gives us in the story. And then she lets her hair down. This is actually a sign of seduction. In fact, women were not allowed to let their hair down in public. Women, if they let their hair down in front of other men or in public, was a grounds for a man to leave his wife and divorce her. It's what almost in like common day of a woman maybe exposing herself or being topless today. It was something you do not do. And she bursts in, she lets her hair down, and she begins to wipe Jesus' feet with her tears. Why did she come? See, we got to ask all these questions. Who's this woman? And we don't know. We just know she was sinful. Why was she there? Obviously, she had heard Jesus' teaching. Obviously, she had heard somewhere that Jesus was able to help. You see, she was there. She must have heard him preach. It's interesting that right before the story in Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29, Jesus is out in the street and he's preaching and he says, come to me all who are weary and weak and I will give you rest. Here's a woman because of her reputation who doesn't know what rest is like. Here's a woman who is outcasted and scorned for her reputation. Here's a woman that everybody knows her junk. Everybody knows her and they're judging her and looking down on her. And she hears Jesus say, come to me and you will find rest. Here's a woman who doesn't have friendships or relationships or fellowships. If you know the story of the woman at the well, she was probably in a similar situation as her, where she had five different husbands and she goes to the well in the middle of the day in order to avoid all criticism. She goes during the hottest part of the day to draw water because she doesn't want to gather there in the morning when the rest of the women gather in order to draw water. Here is somebody who's alone and isolated, and she hears Jesus preach, and she can't help herself to burst into somebody else's house, into somebody else's fellowship, reclining at the table, and she just begins to weep, and she takes her hair, and she washes his feet, and begins to anoint him with oil. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But then the author changes the scene. Notice in verse 39, it says, when the Pharisee Simon, the Pharisee Simon had invited him to see this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is. Now, it's so interesting in verse 39 that he says, that he was thinking to himself. See, he was thinking, if Jesus was a prophet, if he really did know prophecy, if he could really tell people's future, if he could really think inside their heads what they're thinking and know in his prophet abilities, then he would know who this woman's reputation is and he would refuse her. So Simon is thinking this in his head. Notice, Jesus responds to Simon's thoughts. You want to question whether I'm a prophet, Simon? You want to question whether I can read thoughts and I know what people think and I know what they do? Let me answer your thoughts before you even ask them. I mean, it's kind of funny what Jesus does. Simon's sitting here having thoughts to himself. I think it's interesting how God knows everything. Not People don't know all of our stuff, but God does. 
People don't know every thought that we have in our head, but God does. And Jesus has the ability to read Simon the Pharisee's mind. And he begins with a story. He's like, okay, let me tell you your thoughts, Simon. He says, Simon, I have, I have a question for you. He asks him. Verse 40, Jesus answered him. Answered what? He answered his thoughts. He says, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had a bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Simon said. Then turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I love that question. Do you see this woman? Simon, you've missed her so many times in the streets. You've missed her isolated and alone in the corner. While you were doing your religious acts, you missed this woman. You see, Pharisees cared about the rules. Pharisees cared about obeying the law, which is important. But what Pharisees did was they would create laws on top of laws on top of laws. So God gave the Ten Commandments. In order to avoid the Ten Commandments, we need to create 20 more laws on each of those so we don't get to the Ten Commandment. Give you a common illustration. It would be like you being scared that your kids are going to get hit in the road. So you sit, instead of telling them they can only play in the front yard and not in the road, you keep them inside the house. You keep them locked up. And they never get the joy of experiencing the outdoors because you keep them in the house because you're scared of them getting hit by the road. That's what a Pharisee would do. They would create rules on top of rules on top of rules that would back up. And here's the thing. Pharisees cared about laws over people. What we find out about Jesus here is that Jesus cares about people than laws. You see, Pharisees cared about obeying the laws first, and they would overlook the people and their situation and their circumstance. I'm not saying, hey, laws aren't important. It's okay to go break rules. What I'm saying is Jesus cared about people because he says, Simon, do you see her? Simon had mistook her act of devotion to God, her act and love of what she was doing with her hair and her feet as a sexual advance. He misunderstood it. He missed what she was doing. It's so interesting how we can miss things around us that are right in front of us. Recently, I took a, a group to a conference, and as we were at the conference, the Holy Spirit was speaking to every single one differently, and I just thought it was so cool as I, I stood in the back just kind of awing, and I'd have a conversation with somebody on the team, and they'd say, yeah, God was telling me this, and I'd have a conversation with the team saying, I'm really feeling convicted about this, and I was having a conversation with this person there saying, I really feel like God's telling me to do this, and each person's receiving differently, and we had 17 people there, and I thought, this is amazing. All 17 people are receiving in different ways. This is so cool. God is showing up, and then we go home and we have a good night's sleep and we go back the next day and I get a text message from a pastor friend and he says, you know, I don't know what happened to this conference this year. It seems like they're just kind of theologically off. And I thought, man, how interesting that we can get so caught up on theology, that we can get so caught up on the negativity that we can get so caught up on the thoughts that we miss God right before us and what he wants to say to us. You, you, you see, the Pharisee was so caught up on the rules that he was missing what the woman was doing as she was adoring and honoring Jesus. And we can get so caught up with situations and things and circumstances in life that we miss the beauty of God before us. God in the flesh is sitting before them and the Pharisees caught up and distracted by the woman. Instead of putting Jesus in his rightful place, the Pharisee is looking at the woman and what she's doing and disgusted by it. And the truth of the matter is we can get sometimes blinded 
and miss the opportunity to what God is trying to show us because we're so focused on the wrong thing. Have you ever been home and you're supposed to be spending time with your family and your kids and your mind is at work? Have you ever been focused on a task and you lose sight of the beauty of the things around you because you're focused on what hasn't gotten done instead of what it has gotten done? Are, are you so quick to judge yourself even on your to-do list on the things that haven't gotten checked off the box instead of giving yourself credit for the things that... We get focused sometimes on the wrong thing and what we see in the story is that Jesus loves people, not so much the rules first. And he questions Simon on three different things. We, if you're taking notes, there's three facts about Simon. Number one, Simon was inhospitable. What do I mean by this? Because when Jesus corrects Simon, the, the author goes from the woman breaking into the house to Jesus having a conversation with Simon, and he tells her, he goes, you know what this woman has done? Look at the beauty of what this was done. And he says, Simon, you didn't give me water for my feet in verse 44. I came into your house as your guest. You invited me to dinner. You invited me to the table. You didn't even give me water for my feet. You see, it was common practice back then for them to wash their feet at the door, for them to remove their sandals because they didn't have cars like we do. They didn't have nice kicks like we do today. And so they're walking around with sandals and sometimes even barefoot or sometimes with rags on their feet. And when they would get to the house, they would have, be walking on the streets with horses, with cows, with donkeys. They would be walking through manure or dry manure. And so you can imagine their feet would get really dirty. And so to recline at the table, what do you do? You say, I got to wash up, right? I got to wash my hands. As a nice parent, we teach our kids to wash our hands before we sit and eat. They would wash their feet before they would enter into the house because you wouldn't want to bring all that crud from the streets into the house. Sometimes there would be a servant there waiting to wash the feet. At the Last Supper, what we see is Jesus get from the table to get down and take the position of a servant and begin to wash his disciples' feet. He says, Simon, you didn't even give me water to wash my feet. But this woman has washed my feet with her tears. Simon was inhospitable. The second thing what we see that Simon was inhospitable is not that he didn't give him water, but it was also a, a common practice, he tells him. He says, you did not give me a kiss. It was a common practice that when you enter in a house, you would give a person a kiss on the left and the right cheek, kind of how we handshake today, or give a hug or embrace if it's somebody that you know. For Hispanics, what do we do? We often lean in and give a kiss on the cheek. Me, growing up in Michigan, not in the Hispanic culture, when I married my wife, who is Cuban, I wondered if her sister was hitting on me because she would often reach in and give me a kiss. I'm like, ah, I'm not so used to this. Now, I greet people and I lean in and I try to give them a kiss and that's like, oh, I forgot. We're, we're, we're not at that level yet here and I extend my hand, you know? You, you try to figure out these customs. In their custom, it was a common practice to lean in and give a kiss on the left and the right cheek. Simon doesn't even give him a kiss, and he says, but this woman has kissed me. You did not even kiss me in verse 45, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. Now think about that, something so disgusting as they walk around on. Now we wear socks and shoes today, and people still don't like feet. Don't rub my feet. Don't touch my feet. My feet smell. They tickle. You know, we don't like feet. Jesus had been walking through all of this crud on the streets, hadn't washed his feet. She's washing them with her tears and her hair. The crud is in her hair. I'm just picturing, putting this picture before you. And now she's kissing all over these feet because she adores this person who has invited her to find rest and peace in her soul. Talk about honoring God and putting him in his rightful place, the way that he deserves, the way it should be. And then the third thing he was inhospitable is he didn't give perfume. Notice it says, 
Verse 46, you did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Now, perfume can be very expensive. There's another story later on where we see a woman who took a whole year's salary to anoint Jesus over his head later in the scripture before he went to the cross. And the disciples were ridiculing her. Here's another story of perfume where she brings in her perfume. And it was customary for the person to offer some perfume because people sweat. They, they perspire. It's hot out in the day. And so before you lay down at the table, before you recline at the table, you would refresh yourself and put a little bit of perfume on. My, my dad was a, a smoker for 15 years of my life. And he always smelt like cologne because when he would get out for a sales meeting, he would douse himself with cologne. It's kind of like having cologne in your car and we would just put it on in order to cover up any scent or smell. That's what they would often do is they would offer a little bit of perfume and it says, you did not put any oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, he says. You see, Simon was inhospitable. Number two, Simon was judgmental. It's interesting that her sins were known, but Simon's weren't. It, it's interesting that her sins were overt, but Simon's were covert. Covert, like, is hidden operations. We send soldiers in on a covert mission. It's secretive. Everybody knew her sin, and it was exposed, but... Jesus points out, Simon, you got some sin of your own. You got some, your own sin to deal with. If you read a story later on in Luke 18, you see another situation where a Pharisee is praying. And it's a story where a Pharisee is praying and, and there's a tax collector and the Pharisee is giving this long, audacious prayer. God, thank you for making me such a righteous person that makes me want to follow the rules when all those sinners over there, need your judgment. Correct them to be more like me. And the tax collector gets up and says, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please show me mercy. And Jesus says, it's better for the tax collector than it is the Pharisee. See, what Jesus points out here is, Simon, you have some sin in your own life. Your sin is pride. See, pride is one of those sins where it's hard to label. We can label the sins of actions that people do, but pride comes from the heart. Pride comes from within. Pride is one of those hidden sins where we think that we're better than somebody else, where we think we have it all put together. See, this is why Jesus tells him the story. He says, listen, if one person forgives you of a little debt, you might not be so gracious, but if they give you a big debt, I'll give you an example. If someone today came to you and you said, I forgot to make my car payment, it's late, and you called the bank, and the bank says, you know what? It's okay that it's late. In fact, don't make that payment. Don't make any more payments. We're gonna send you the title to your car. The debt is paid off fully forgiven, you would be overjoyed. You would be bragging about that bank. You would be telling everybody else about that bank. You would be sharing about that information. Jesus forgave this woman of all of her debt. She's overjoyed. She's sharing. How many of us are willing to share our faith? How many of us are willing to brag about God for what he did? Or do we keep it covert? Do we keep it inside? Do we keep it hidden because we don't want everybody to know, oh, we're on the, the team of Christianity. We're on, we're on this field. We're over here. Do our friends know about our faith? Do our coworkers know about our faith? Are we bragging people and saying, you got to come to my church because you got to hear about Jesus. You got to join my power group because you got to hear about Jesus. You know what? Let me share with you about what my Savior did for me this week. Are we bragging about it? Or are we keeping it inside? Covert versus overt. Simon was judgmental. He looked down on this woman. The third sin that Simon had was that it was invisible. His sin was invisible. Not only was he in judgmental, but it couldn't be seen. 
So let me ask you, which character are you? You see, there's two types of characters here. People who think they are righteous. And the second one is people who know that they are sinners. Do you think that you're righteous or do you know that you're a sinner? And and here's the truth of the matter. We often compare sins. We often look at somebody and say, you know what? I'm at least not as bad as that person over there. And when we begin to compare sins, we boost our ego a little bit. We boost our pride, and we don't think, oh, we're that bad. But we're not supposed to compare with the person next to us. We're supposed to compare with Jesus. If I'm standing next to Jesus, am I a bad person? If I'm standing next to God in the flesh, can I stand at all? If I'm standing with God... I see if I compare myself with him, I don't even measure up. You see, do we see that we're sinners or do we see that we're righteous? I love Judah Smith's four stages. He he talks about four different characters of people. Stage number one, I'm a good person and I'm justified in criticizing bad people. You see, we think we're self as good and as we think ourselves as good, it's easy to criticize somebody else. I wouldn't have done it that way. I wouldn't have made that decision. I wouldn't have made that mistake. That can sometimes be pride rising within. We have to be very careful. I don't have that temptation, but you have your temptation. You have the mistakes you've made. You've had the decisions and the places you've messed up. You haven't even been in that person's circumstance. You haven't been in their situation. You haven't been in their shoes. And if you haven't been in their shoes and walked a mile in their steps, don't you dare judge them. God judges and has the right to judge us all, and yet Jesus isn't judging this woman. Notice he's judging more the Pharisee who's walking around with a righteous attitude. I'm a good person. I'm unjustified by criticizing bad people. Stage number two, we realize that maybe we're not so good. And it says, I'm a good person, but I should show compassion to bad people. I should love them. I need to fix them. I need to make them more like me. I need to work on them. They become my pet project. And then we move to stage number three. More or less when we realize that we're a sinner and it says I'm a sinner who needs just as much help as the next guy. I need help. We're all at level playing foot at field on the foot of the cross. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. Yes, you're a sinner and yes, you have a different sin than I do and yes, maybe you struggle in yours more than you do but we all have fallen short and we're all here equal. We're as equal as the next guy but the fourth stage is really where we want to get to. The fourth stage is where we want to walk to in our Christian life, and it says, I am loved by Jesus just as I am, and so is everyone else. See, when we can see people in the same eyes that we see ourselves, that we all need Jesus, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so... I got three application points for you. Number one, we're all sinners. We're all sinners. In fact, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Maybe you have a different sin than I do, but we've all fallen short. We've all messed up. We've all made mistakes. No one is righteous, not even one, it says. We're all, every single one of us, have fallen short. Jesus says to the woman, you're a sinner. But he also says to Simon, you are a sinner. It's not based on your rules. It's not based on your laws. It's not based on your regulations. Notice what he tells this woman at the very end. After he corrects Simon, he tells her, your sins are forgiven that's where he goes he says then jesus said to her your sins are forgiven the other guests began to say among themselves who is this who even forgives 
sins. Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What Jesus is saying to Simon is that I didn't come to judge. I came to save. I didn't come to judge the sins of this woman and keep her from the table. I I came to save this woman. We're all sinners. But number two is the beautiful thing about it is that God wants to forgive. He wants to forgive. Look at what Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. He says, I want to give you the gift of free life. I want to save you. You are drowning in your sin and you did not realize it. You were dead in your sin and you needed someone to give you life, to breathe life into you. The only way to do that is by receiving Jesus. It's a free gift. It's a free gift that he died for you on the cross. Not only did he want to do it, he knew he was going to do it and chose to go to the cross for you in order to show you God's love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He's a God who gives. He's a God who loves. He went to the cross to show us that God gave us his son in order for us to have eternal life, in order for us to know how much he loved him. For God so loved the world world it says he gave us life he wants to forgive luke 19 10 as this pharisee is judging this woman there's another story where jesus goes to zacchaeus house and they say jesus even eats with sinners and he says for the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost Jesus came to seek and save the lost. That's why he came. God wants to forgive. Number one, we gotta realize we're sinners. Number two, we gotta realize that God wants to forgive. He wants to. He's dying to forgive us. He died to forgive us. And number three, salvation is by faith. Salvation is by faith. Notice what he tells this woman. He says, you need to go and believe. He says, the other guests began, then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who forgives sin? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It's interesting how her faith has saved her. Jesus says your sins are forgiven, but she still has to believe in faith. Jesus says your sins are forgiven, but she still has to trust that her sins are forgiven. Jesus makes the proclamation. He makes the promise, but as she leaves that house, she has to believe it. She has to trust it. She has to walk every step in faith, believing that her sins are forgiven. When we leave this place, we have to believe that God has transformed us. When we pray our prayers, we have to believe that God hears them. When we ask God something in faith, we have to step forward and believe that he's going to give us an answer. When he says your sins are forgiven, we have to leave and believe that our sins are forgiven, that they have been cast as far as the east is from the west, that our sins are no more. Stop beating yourself up. If God's not judging you, why do you judge yourself? If God's not beating you up, why do you continue to beat yourself up? You need to walk into your future knowing that your sins are forgiven, believing it and accepting and receiving the gift and now living for him. He's given you second opportunities. He's given you second chances. That's the type of God we have. And so as we walk forward, stop judging others. Stop judging yourself. And believe because Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. You didn't earn your salvation, it says. So quit boasting about it. Quit judging somebody else. The other day, we had a person who was 
just being so rude and my kids were so angry about it. Dad, you need to put them in their place, they said. You need to go caring on them. I said, isn't it interesting that we have a gift that they don't? Isn't it interesting that we have something that they're missing? You shouldn't sit here and judge them and belittle them and try to hurt them and retaliate them. You should pray for them because they need something that you have already. You have Jesus. You have peace. You have the gift and the fruits of the Spirit. And peace is one of those. So why do I have to go and retaliate against that person, go caring on them? When I have a gift, I need to thank God for the gift he's already given me. And I need to pray for the person who doesn't have the gift that I have. Because it's nothing that I did to earn this. It's nothing I did to deserve it. It's a gift that's been given. So why should I judge somebody else for not having it? And then Romans 10, 8 and 9 says, but what you does it says the word is near you it is in your mouth and it is in your heart that the message confirming faith that we proclaim if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved you have to declare it and believe it that's what we have to do so I'm going to ask for you to bow your heads with me Father God we thank you for today we thank you for the gift of Jesus We thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Father, as we come before you today, I ask that people will receive the gift. If someone is here for the very first time hearing this, how you want to save them, and they realize that they're a sinner, and maybe they've been separated from you for a long time, it's time for them to come to the table. It's time for them to be invited into the house like this woman. When Simon was outcasting her, it's so easy for the church to outcast and judge others for their appearance or the way they look. But Jesus doesn't judge. Jesus recognizes that she's a sinner, yes, but he offers her grace. He offers her forgiveness. He offers her peace. He offers her hope. He offers her, offers a transformed life to her. If there's anybody here listening that wants a little bit of what God is offering at his table today, I pray that they come to the table and have a bite. I pray that they sit down and have a meal. I pray that they come here and they don't, get pushed away but they get embraced and hugged and loved in Jesus name I pray God's people said amen